which are investor friendly states, which and our criteria there was which have the least amount of hassle in evicting tenants. As an operator, I know other investors are romanticizing multifamily investing, and I'm looking to learn from other investors' mistakes. I know you are too, and you found the right place. Welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Hey everybody and welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. I'm your host Jerome. I have the grand pleasure of having Rashmi with me today. How are things out in Cali? Very sunny, which is perfect at this time of the year. It's perfect. Uh, we're back in quarantine again, but life is good. No complaints. Beautiful. So I always ask up front because sometimes people don't listen to the whole thing. What's the best way for listeners to get in contact with you? Sure. My email address, which is Rashmi, R-A-S-H-M-I dot Nigam. So N as in Nancy, I-G-A-M as in Mary at Gmail. So simple. Guys, blow her up. <laughs> There's so many female investors in the multifamily space. You've got to get on Rashmi's calendar. <laughs> She's an amazing person. And is. This is going to be a great interview because I know she's got some great stories and she's such a straight shooter. A lot of people try to finesse it and try to dress it up and she just tells you how it is and I love it. So tell us a little bit about your background because I don't do bios, right? Who are mm -hmm. you? How'd you get into multifamily? And then we'll get into the first, the deal that we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. But you know, before we get started, I just want to say it is such an honor to be speaking with you because this is actually my first podcast ever. And, and it's so crazy because literally 10 minutes before we met and you say, hey, you want to be a guest? I'd made a mental note saying, you know what? I got to figure out how to get on a podcast in the next 30 days. And the universe just offered you. I'm like, whoa, I should have asked the universe for a lottery. But, uh, and, you know, we'd, I'd been following you on social media. And, you know, you, know, you know, I like a lot of stuff you do, especially the dad club and stuff. And like, you know, he's a cool, legit, authentic guy. So I was, I was really, I'm really happy to be here and sort of doing this for the first time. Um, so a little about me. So, you know, I grew up in Africa, Malawi, and India, and sort of, you know, that's sort of where my early childhood and living was. Then I came to the U.S. in from my undergrad in chemical engineering. And so by the time senior year comes around, I was like, I don't really want to work with chemicals because I didn't like it. You know, and also when I was thinking of careers, I didn't want to work in a plant and manage all these crazy plants running. It wasn't sort of, I, I just didn't care much for it. And I'm like, all right, let's go do computers. So I got a master in computers. And so I started working in the tech world, the startup world. After a while, I'm like, I don't really like working coding. I love the business aspect of stuff. I love taking technology and getting it out to consumers and solving pain points that they're interested in. So which is basically called a product management function. So I've done that, you know, and I still do it. I've still maintained um, my work um, while building my real estate portfolio. Along the way, sort of, I've worked in the dating space, video gaming space. Now I do influencer marketing. Also got my MBA. You know, I got married, have two kids, and we just started picking up multifamily buildings along the way. Uh, you know, in some ways, I think my journey's in the reverse because you often hear people say, "We did single family, we did this." Well, I did none of that. I just went straight into multifamily and, um, you know, started off. So I've done about nine transactions so far and sort of gone five full cycle. And in the last two years, sort of picked up passive investing. And now I'm really hoping, you know, my 2021 plan is to get into my first syndication deal, like do it and lead it. Wow. She's smart, y'all. She's a chemical engineer now. Y'all better watch out. Okay. So you skipped the whole single family thing. Tell me, right. what gave you the courage to do that? Everybody says you got to, you know, buy a house and be regular. So that's funny. We were the last people amongst our friends to buy a house. We bought our home now two years ago. So I was like, are we the losers? Because everybody else bought their homes. I think, you know, courage for me was, uh, so when I, when I was growing up, um, I lost my mom when I was nine. And so my dad, you know, it was just my dad, my brother and I, and we'd rented out this really nice home growing up in, this was back in India. And 
the landlord lived in one part of the like mansion that I never saw, and we were paying him gobs of rent money. He was a doctor, but he got gobs of money also. I'm like, wow. So a nine year old was like, money not working. So you know, equated that, and I was so paranoid of losing my dad at that point. And I was like, you know what? I need to sort of. But also seeing that, I was like, you know what? I need to have real estate because if something happens to him, I can put my brother and I through college. And so we can sort of, you know, get out into the other adult world. So I sort of pestered him sort of all along. I'm like, bye, bye, bye. And then he landed up going on a shopping spree. Uh, so, so I think some of it came from that. So when we first started buying, you know, we bought in class D property, um, class D areas. And we just bought, and again, very small thinking, right? It was very much one for this kid's college, one for this kid's college, one for our retirement, and we were happy. It was just, that's how we operated. We managed it, we ran it. Oh boy, we got creative all across, working with tenants, getting financing. And then, you know, as luck has it, um, I have a habit, if somebody calls me for advice, whether it's career in the tech space or in just brokers, I pick up the phone. And I always pick up the phone. And so in this case, um, I had a broker call, hey, you want to sell this? Because what we had done at that point was, in hindsight, at that time, it felt like we didn't know anything. But now, given how much education sort of I've been absorbing the last three years, we did a lot of right things along the way, sort of using gut, intuition, and data. You know, and, we're, and so, you know, so we bought in LA, non-rent control, which is unheard of. Um, single fam, you know, single floors, you don't have all the repairs issues. And we sort of almost bought them side by side. So we sort of built this plotage, which we didn't realize. So we just packaged the whole thing up and then we sold it. So I had a broker just call. I'm like, okay, he goes, you can do this. You can upscale, you can do that. And so that's sort of how we moved, got out of LA. And then we sort of moved out of state to uh, Tucson and Kansas City. Okay, so you did you did everything right then. In hindsight, it feels that right at that point it didn't. And you know, again, in the last three years, I've spent so much of my time, free time has been focused on self development, changing your mindset, being, getting the courage to go out and put yourself out there, right, socially and stuff. And so now when I look back and I look at all the gurus and I'm looking at their underwriting sheets and I'm looking at their assumptions, I'm like, okay, we weren't too, this, mind you, this was pre-education. I'm like, okay, you know, my underwriting sheet is pretty close to what they did. You know, pretty, you know, my assumptions were pretty close. We had a framework for evaluating buildings. We just didn't know we were doing it. Okay. okay. And so you buy buildings and... Tucson and Kansas City? That's correct. After liquidating LA? Yes. All right. So now you're out of state and mm -hmm. not a car drive out of state. This is plane flights, right? You know, I have done 24 hour round trips to Tucson, car driving. And we did a few of that during Corona. So, but, but yes, you're right. These are plane trips. And... Okay. So did anything go wrong with out of state investing? How oh, they always do. I think, I think the point is there's always something that goes wrong with something. And there's mistakes you make, there's stuff that you can control and stuff you can't control. And so my general philosophy is, you know what? It's okay to make mistakes, you know, learn to minimize your risks so you don't lose it all, but don't repeat it again because then you're the fool. Like that's sort of, the, you know, it's okay, just get over it, move on, right? I mean, so we moved out and we bought a 50 unit in Tucson, again, so we did a framework, you know, again, we had a lot of sort of, you know, hey, you know, we, at that point, and now, you know, I, I would probably do certain things differently. We're like, okay, we wanted two or three unit um, bedroom units because those are families, they tend to stick longer, so you don't have turnover costs, we didn't want a chiller, but this building actually even had a chiller. So, you know, we were doing all the inspections. We went through every single apartment building out there to see what the insides looked like, what the rent was within the area. We went to the police station to find out what was going on. Again, not knowing that there's a methodology to this, but just doing what was right. So we bought it. Um, you know, what we loved about this was a property manager was incredible at that time. He's like a 50-year-old guy. 
Um, we had reservations about the building because it's got a chiller system and I, I don't want to do chiller and now I avoid it. And, but we liked him so much. And you know, the interesting thing about 50 units is it's not enough to have a full-time leasing person and not enough to have a maintenance person. You just don't have the cash flow. So you have to find people that like to do both, like to deal with tenant and like to fix stuff. So, you know, those are hard to find. So he was perfect. They had great energy, great everything. Because of him, we went with the property management firm we did because we really wanted him there. Two days before we closed escrow, he died on the job. A uh, healthy young guy, it's like, we're like, whoa, okay. Obviously we closed and, <laughs> and then it was a long journey. Um, this property management firm, I think we had maybe chosen for the wrong reasons. And in hindsight, now if I see them managing a smaller building, I'll go after a deal because I know how badly they're managing it. It's like it's almost a strategy looking at them. But so they stuck around, but I think their specialty is sort of like, you know, the 200 or the 150 unit portfolio because, you know, their cost was like 25%. In here. Like, you know, it's like that, exactly. So when I do my underwriting, if I see that property management firm in a building, I'm like, I got it. I don't, I don't need to do a thorough due diligence because I know I can save this cost down by 15% off immediately. Uh, so we started trying to find that unicorn and it took us nine months. Nothing lasted. You'd find temps, you would find um, just not good people. And they brought it to ground, literally. And and, you know, it got better and better as it went. And, you know, we had rules built in place where you're like, hey, you know what, if you spend more than 300 bucks, sort of, um, you know, check with me and none of that, you know, some, so some stuff was happening, some was not. I think the asset director wasn't as hands on as needed to be on top of the 10 people. So long story short, you know, lesson learned, right? So basic lesson. So finally, after about 15 months, I was like, hey, I'm gonna go find somebody to start replacing. So that took a few months to interview, found a property management firm and I fired them. Now there's always a lesson, right? Whether it's real estate or technology or anybody, nobody ever says, damn, I waited too long to fire that person, right? They always regret this, I should have done it sooner. And so that's sort of a lesson learned, right? It's sort of, I should have um, let them go sooner, um, replaced it, brought in a good one. So then we did. <laughs> and, yeah, and there were other mistakes there, so that was it. So right, we found a new property management firm and after they came in, uh, two days before we closed, our property management firm is we have $40,000 in unpaid invoices. Like, could you not? So I'm still thinking, actually, I'm, I still have it on my two if I wanna take legal action or not. Although I don't know if I can at this point. I'm like $40,000. And so anyway, so we did the right buy. We kept paying, kept paying. You know, because we have W-2 jobs and this is sort of um, passive play to keep building, right? If I had investors, if I had other people, it's a very, it's a shameful story in some ways, right? Saying you have this, you're not transparent and, uh, or you didn't know. You know, because it was us all along and we were investing the returns, you know, it didn't matter as much to, so anyway, so property management firm was done. The other mistakes, right? Because we were always trying to find the person. We never focused on cosmetic improvements, something that could have been really, really easy to do, right? We, um, yeah, we should have done that. Um, things have changed. I, I sit on my property management firm but at this point, I'm on top of every number. I'm on top of everything. You know, again, can't repeat the mistake again. A lot of people want to be profitable multifamily operators, but lack the knowledge, deal flow, experience, and capital to be successful. They often try to overcome these challenges out of order, slowing or eliminating their ability to get their next deal done. We've developed a framework that allows them to gain the knowledge they need to find profitable deals. When they do, they create the time and location for you, as well as the generational wealth they desire for their family. The Myers methods of multifamily investing have proved to be the fastest way to establish credibility and properly grow an apartment portfolio. If you want to know more about our four-step process, jump over to MyersMethods.com to get our free four-step guide to getting into multifamily investing. Let's get back to the episode. So 
You talked about the 40,000 in unpaid invoices. Was there other financial impact or collateral damage from kind of just letting the property manager do their thing? Yeah, it's it's like, you, you know, it's easy to blame them. And this is where the balance comes in, right? At the end, they do what you want them to do. So the blame also lies with us. Um, maybe it was the first time big building thinking that, hey, you know what, you're part of a professional to do the job and let them do it. Um, you know, I think, you know, rent's not collected, um, just front advertising not done. I mean, across the board, the operations were seriously a disaster because we never had longevity. Um, you know, the other thing that was really interesting, um, we brought in a manager to come live on site. That's a no-no, like you don't do that because at some point they become friends with the tenants. And once that boundary is done, it's very hard for them to start collecting rent and charging late fees. And it's sort of like, you know, there's always that um, boundary you need to maintain with your tenants. So yeah, so I've never ever allowed that again. Um, so the other property management firm that we did bring in, you know, and which is the model we've carried on in our other buildings now is sort of, hey, you know, um, you don't need on-site presence. Cause again, you know, I, I like to sort of be so far on our own, um, you know, sort of be in the 60 to 75, 50 to 75 units range. Cause it's too small for the big syndicators. They have so much money to give out to everybody that it's just not worth it. And it's not enough experience. And, you know, the mom and pops don't have that much experience. It's like a really sweet spot where if you find the right property manager who can do the cost structure and stuff, it's profitable. And sort of that's sort of what we've done now. It's sort of, I don't even have anybody on site. We're leveraging technology because we, um, you know, now I have a 61 unit um, also in Tucson. Um, you know, so we, we have it sort of all sort of handled via technology and nobody on site. Got it. Okay. So no real financial impact or collateral damage. I know you changed the model, but other than the 40, were you? There was no cash flow for almost, um, you know, I think almost seven months with the back rent collect, you know, with the back rent payments. I mean, 40, those $40,000 because the vacancies increased, like it was just, I think because there was, and this is where branding and this is where having somebody on site makes a world of difference, right? And there was nobody there dealing with, um, you know, answering calls, dealing with some of this and at least this property management firm didn't have it. So our vacancies fell down. Um, I think we were at like 20% vacancy at this point and unpaid invoices and not filling stuff in. And by the time we fired the firm, so this new property management came in, no paperwork there. But it does have a nice story at the end um, that paid, <laughs> it works out in the end. <laughs> it does work out in the end if you can see it through. But I think where people get stuck is in that middle space where the property's not making enough money to take care of itself. You've got to infuse capital to get over that hurdle. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you do when you change property managers. It's going to be some changing costs. You're going to find some stuff that you didn't enjoy, like the $40,000 in unpaid invoices and so on. So I think you absolutely have to be engaged on a biweekly or weekly basis. So with that said, when you say you're on the property manager's butt, what does that mean? What does that look like? Are you just looking in the system at the reporting? Or are you meeting with them regularly? Like, how did you change your system to make sure that the this doesn't For both. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The system's changed. I think really paying attention to the numbers, right? Really, really trying to understand across every line item, not just looking at, okay, here's their income, here's the expenses, here's the NOI, great. Like, it's like, okay, you know, why is the HVAC cost so high? And why is plumbing this much? Why is that? I do, um, because of COVID, I haven't been meeting them lately um, in person, but you know, we do have um, weekly calls every day. Um, in the case of first 10 days of the month, I'm looking at the reports daily to get a pulse of what's happening. And then there's a couple of emails back and forth on, okay, you know what, what are these repairs? What are this? What are these invoices? And here's my business plan. What are you doing? Right. And, 
you know, and it's, it's interesting because I have three different property management firms right now that I'm managing and working through. And, you know, two of them are great. And one of them is like, oh, you know, so I'm getting ready to have a discussion with them because you know what, um, you, you have to act early at this point. I'm not going to let that mistake come in. Got it. Okay. And so the way that I always wrap these episodes is what words of wisdom do you have for the listeners? You know, just follow your gut and take a step um, and minimize your risk. Like, you know, and again, you know, multifamily, what, what I've done involves a lot of time and effort. You know, I'm obsessed with, I do spend a lot of my free time, but there's multiple other ways for you to get into this path. This is not the only path. You can, there's a passive path that works perfectly well. There's lots of other paths. Let's just explore or REITs or any, anything else. Like just, but take a step. And make sure it aligns with you. Uh, yeah, and you know, just also just to sort of wrap up with, you know, once again, I got a call from a broker at this 50 unit and, and I picked it up because that's what I do. It was an off-market listing. He goes, I have somebody who wants to buy this. I'm like, okay, I have a number. Um, Cause I, again, I keep my documentation up to track. Everything was there, I have a number and I already knew what the market valuation was. I'm like, I have a number, but these are all the issues. We're just in the middle of resolving it, but it's yours to take it. And they did. So in Q1 or Q2, I think we closed Q2 of this year. Uh, he literally uh, resold it for the highest per unit price in the asset class. So, you know, so it, it works out. It always works out. I mean, it was a nice profit in the end. You know, it was a painful lesson learned, but it didn't impact as much as it could have it could well you can only do that if you buy it right right absolutely absolutely if you you pay premium price and you don't operate or execute the business plan that's a sad story at the end right so you know the way our framework there has always been again you know we got out of california because california was not right it is not an investor from, I don't think anybody will say that. And everybody knows that. It's like, it's so, you don't even have to say that anymore. You know, so in our framework, you know, when we were looking at it, it was always, um, you know, hey, which are investor friendly states, which, and our criteria there was, which have the least amount of hassle in evicting tenants. And so, you know, Arizona and Kansas and Texas, I'm sure there's plenty more. And then it was sort of like, okay, where is there not enough land to go? where are the good schools and crime? So it was sort of like layered upon layered. And then you find, okay, what is a mixed balance, right? One units, only one units can be problematic. Older buildings can be problematic. How much maintenance is there? You know, and then, so we just walked in and so, but you're right. I think knowing what to buy at that point makes a difference. This is phenomenal. I just love seeing people operate and operating well. And, you know, the myth that you just buy it and then property manager takes it over and you don't have to do anything. You just kind of kick your feet up. I don't think that's ever really the situation that happens. Um, no. Especially no. with stuff that's not, you know, a hundred plus. I think there's yep. always some hands-on involvement from the owner or asset manager on these size deals. So I'm just, I'm super grateful for you coming on and sharing. I'm super grateful that you shared with me on your first podcast. I I like bringing people into the space and giving them opportunities. And, um, you know, one of my goals is really to help with expanding the voices that are heard, right? I think, you know, you can look around and you don't really see many people. There's very little, there's a lot of homogeneity or homo, homogeny is that mm-hmm. where homogeny um in multifamily and i always question is it because people aren't out there or because we aren't looking hard enough and so this is really exciting for me and i'm going to commit to you to help you get on more shows awesome thank you so that's a wrap guys um don't forget to like and subscribe Rashmi, anything else for the listeners No, just pursue your dreams. Go at it. Be brave. All right, guys, we'll talk to you the next time. (laughs) You made it to this juncture. So you really love what we shared on this episode of Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Do us a favor. 
Give us a five-star rating. Give us a review. And share this with somebody who's interested in multifamily investing. Until the next time, the pack is with you.